There were three incidents that happened early in my career that I kind of dwell on regularly because it kind of changed the way I do business. And so I'm going to tell you the stories behind that. Um, first one happened on, in Cook City uh, early in the season, December 6th, and I was with Scott Schmidt, who most of you here know in the room. Uh, Scott at the time was working as an avalanche forecaster uh, with me, and he and I went to Cook City early season to check on conditions. And this is a, a Google Earth image of Cook City. Um, Lulu Pass area is up here. And I'm going to discuss um, the first incident, um, which ties into number two. And, uh, and then I'll conclude in Cook City with uh, this third incident as well. So we'll start out with number one here. Number one is on this, uh, on, on a slope, which, let me go back. Um, number one. Actually, we need the center lights on, otherwise the um, the video won't pick it up. Okay, keep it off. Um, <laughs> it's more important that we get it. <laughs> so, go there December 6th. It's snowing and blowing out. It's full-on Cook City storm. Um, there's been avalanche activity, considerable danger. Scott and I climb up this slope. We're, you know, 1,000 feet up this slope and we're investigating the crown of an avalanche that had happened either the day before or earlier that day. We dig our snow pit and it's an ice crust and underneath the ice crust is some facets and it's about three to four feet deep. And as we're doing, so we do our snow pit and here is what I have in my notebook. And the important thing is this right here. Say, when we're done, we're leaving this, this, this site, and we get this huge collapse, and it fractures the new snow below the pit after we dug it. And so Scott and I, being complete mental giants, we're like, oh, this is great. This is so cool, because what this means is tomorrow, like, all these paths that went, they're going to go again, because they're already fracturing on that weak layer. And at the time, I hadn't seen that very much, where... We'll, we'll get repeat avalanches on the same weak layer. So we take note of this. We know it's a problem. We're, we're excited we saw it. We talk about it. Um, it's very upfront. We're very, you know, like I said, we're pretty pumped about it. So this is the layer. It was 140 centimeters total snow height. You know, about half the pit, 65 is where it was breaking. Go to Cook City, drink some Bud Light, eat a chicken fried steak. Next day we come out again and we go to number two, first thing in the morning. This slope here, it's Henderson Bench is what this is called, this big bench here. And this site is the similar elevation, similar aspect, and also has a similar snowpack of number one. So we, we went there knowing this, it's one of our spots that we dig regularly. And so we go here, and this is the slope. This is not taken on the day that it happened because it's still storming and blowing out, but this is the big bench. And Schmidt is standing over here in these trees. And I say, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get to an, a good spot and I'm going to dig a pit. And so I skin on out and he's watching me. And right in here is low angle. It's only probably 25. I don't even think it's 30 degrees right there, but it starts to steepen up right over here. And so I stop and dig my pit right there. Before I actually stop and dig the pit is I'm skinning out there. It's all just a sea of white. It's all perfectly smooth. But my skis hit an old crown line. So I'm like, oh my God, this is weird. Like this is, you couldn't see it at all, but I'm on, I just, my skis impacted this old crown line. So I yell over to Schmitty. And I'm like, dude, this is so cool. Like, my skis just hit the old crown line. This is, this is just so badass. Like, this whole thing had slid before. You know, it probably slid yesterday. Come on out. So he follows my tracks, comes out, and we dig a snow pit. And we dig our snow pit. And we have skis are off, packs are off, shovels are off to the side, because now we're, like, looking at the layers and as we're in the pit, the entire slope just goes whoom. And two to three foot inch fracture forms, and the slope doesn't go. The whole slope, this entire slope fractured, 
and moved but did an avalanche. And Schmidt and I just look at each other and then we just start laughing because we're like, oh my God, we almost fucking died. Like, this is crazy. Like, we almost died here. And we were just, we couldn't believe, I mean, it, we knew immediately as soon as it cracked what went wrong. That the day before we had recognized the problem of, hey, it's going to avalanche again if it's already avalanched. And, uh, but we just kind of, in the excitement, blew it off. We're both standing out there. We're both in the pit, in avalanche terrain. And the only thing I believe that saved our life is that thing had slid the day before and maybe the weak layer wasn't quite as sensitive and it arrested the, you know, arrested that, the fracture happening the next day. So this, up here we had 200 centimeters. Um, it was still, the weak layer was down here at 65. So we had about 140 centimeters um, you know, a little over four feet of, uh, of, of snow there. Um, huge collapse and fracture. We, we, we named the slope Almost Dives. That's what it's known as today. If you go into the Snow Pilot database, you'll see tons of snow pits with the title Almost Died. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the big lessons that we talked about there, or the big lesson, is having two people in the pit at the same time. Because especially with our skis off, packs off, shovels not even in our hands, that if anything went wrong and we're both swept down through the trees, there's no one to do a rescue. I mean, no one would know we were missing until the next day when we didn't show up back in Bozeman and people were like, oh, those guys were in Cook. And then they find the sleds up there and come looking for us. So it was really, really stupid. So I had thought I totally learned a lesson, but of course I'm a slow learner. Three months later, I'm also in Cook City on Scotch Bonnet. This shoot here is called the Rasta Shoots. It's uh, near Lulu Pass. I'm here with Chris Lundy this time. And, uh, and so it's storming. It had snowed three feet of snow in the last five days. Skiing was awesome. Um, it was snowing and blowing out when we were there. We skinned up through these trees. We got to the top. And we skied down. And we skied down right to there. And the terrain up here, it's about 30 degrees, 25 to 30 degrees, not very steep. But right here, which you can't see in the picture in this photo, is a, uh, this is a rollover right here. And it's about 37 degrees right here. And I like digging my pits there. I would always dig there, like right where the X is, right at the steepest part of the slope. And so Chris and I dig our snow pit and it's snowing it's blowing and we decide after doing all our stability tests we got a stuff block 40 quality one low down I'll show you the pit in a second and we're standing there and I say to Chris and well you know I mean it doesn't seem that bad seems like we should uh we could ski this, just kind of do it safely, stick, you know, I'm kind of making stuff up in my mind, really, you know, I'm saying stuff like, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll hug the trees on the left-hand side. If anything goes wrong, you can duck into the trees, but I bet, I bet it's going to be really bad tomorrow as it keeps snowing and blowing. But right now we're good to ski this. So this is, and Chris is like, yeah, me too. I think that too, you know, we should, we should do this. So Chris steps out of the snow pit, clicks into his ski, and as he clicks into his ski, the entire slope fractures three feet deep, goes 800 feet down, full track, takes out trees, and we're just standing there looking at, this is, I'm sorry, this is number three, we're over here in this, uh, in these little shots right here is where the avalanche happened. This is, this, this is Chris, this is the three foot fracture line, that's my snow pit right there and so Chris and I once you know here we were both in the snow pit not only were we both in the snow pit at the same time we're also making a really bad assessment we're assuming that things are safe when they're not because the snow is really good we were all excited we thought we were I was feeling really smart that day I'm like oh yeah we totally got a handle on this you know tomorrow you couldn't ski it but right now we could totally ski it so here's another picture. There's the, there's the, the snow pit right there. And this is the snow pit. 
and we had a stuff block 40, quality one. Uh, the height of snow was 270, so this is just the upper 120 centimeters of the snowpack. Um, it was great skiing, like I said. Um, but this right here, this stuff block 40, I was putting way, way too much emphasis on one stability test, especially because it was falling in that realm of what well, wasn't totally unstable. It's not like I'm getting a stuff block 10 or 20, you know, 40 is kind of that middle of the road. And, uh, and I put a lot into that, which was wrong. And uh, as we saw when I, when Chris stepped out of the pit and, and fractured it. So the main lesson there is once again, putting two people in a snow pit at the same time, we were absolutely lucky that if that snow pit was two feet, maybe three feet lower, just lower down the slope, we would have been in the avalanche. As Chris stepped out of that pit, he would have been in it. It would have been too late. And uh, it was, it's a big path, it would, would have been horrible. So it was just pure, it was pure luck that the pit wall wasn't taken out in the avalanche. And, uh, and so um, I'm happy to say that after this incident, or this incident, um, I definitely am hyper aware about bringing people out onto a slope as I'm digging my snow pit. I still blow it every now and then, but it's a lot rarer than, uh, than it used to be. The third accident or incident I'm going to talk about um, happened on Mount Wheeler in the Northern Gallatin Range. Mount Wheeler's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a, it's a little peak, rounded, really. Uh, it used to see a lot more traffic because you used to be able to snowmobile right to the base of it. And uh, then they shut off the snowmobile and it's now it's a long ski in, so it doesn't see as much traffic. But this is a Google Earth image of, uh, of, of uh, Mount Wheeler. Mount Wheeler also has similar snowpack to a lot of stuff we see on Mount Ellis. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a good place to go. So in 2002, I go here with my partner, Alan Oram. And we go out and you approach it from this, uh, this ridge right here, you, it's, it's really low angle, you come out, and then you can ski these shots here. And I dug a pit right there. And dug this pit, we skied, it, it was great skiing. It was another like, you know, foot, foot and a half anew. Um, actually it was a little less, I think it was like a foot anew, but it had snowed a bunch that week. So we ski down, break trail back up, we do two laps right here. When we're breaking trail, we are breaking trail almost on the ground because it is the, the snowpack. There's so much new snow. The snow is weak, um, it, and trail breaks in, is a, is a bit of a bit of a pain. And you can see here, this is this was my snow pit that day. So I've got a hundred centimeters of snow. It's not very deep. Um, I got a break in the in kind of the newer old snow here. Um, stuff block zero quality two. Um, but as I make in my notes here, I'm saying I'm breaking trail and I'm sinking half to three quarters of the way in. So, so my skis are way down here. We do our two laps and I'm not, we're not really worried about anything. I mean, it's just great skiing. And we come over to here, just move over just ever so slightly. And when we move over, the aspect changes just a little, but I notice that even though my skis are still sinking far into the snowpack, the upper layers just are just a hair meatier. They're just, I mean, yeah, they're still fist hardness, but they're maybe fist plus. Like I could just sense that it was just slightly little more, little more meat to it, a little more, uh, you know, it's a little denser, but whatever. I mean, I didn't really think about it too much at the time. And uh, I stand here. And I tell Alan, yeah, you know, you're good to go. Go, go take a run. So Alan skis. He's coming from here. He skis down. And as he skis down, he's just mocking as he's ripping down. Comes down and he triggers this tiny little 25-foot wide slope right there. Well, what happens is this, when he collapses it, it's sympathetics to that. So he's down in here, he's skiing, he has no idea anything's coming because he, he didn't even know he had triggered the small one. He's down here when this whole thing rips, clocks him from behind, tumbles him, and uh, he's okay. 
So he's, he's buried to his waist. He loses a ski, loses a pole. He's uninjured. He saw God. I saw God. It was crazy. I'm like, oh my God, it's game time. Like, I got to get it right. And, uh, you know, luckily he wasn't buried. So when I look at, this is the other page of my notes here where I drew a little schematic. It was about 150 to 200 feet wide. Um, he ended up down here. The whole thing was close to a, a, a thousand feet. Um, we had some old tracks from a week before that we could still uh, sort of make out there. Um, so he was buried to his waist. The debris was three to four feet deep. This is what it slid on right here. This was the sliding surface where I had the stuff block zero quality to right in that density change. Now I had, I had taught a few times with uh, Doug and Jill up in Alaska. Um, and uh, they, I remember them saying, you can get slab avalanche. I've seen slab avalanches at 3% density. Now I respect those guys a lot. And, but I have to say, when they told me that, I thought, yeah, right, no way. I mean, I'm like, yeah, whatever, 3%, you know, never seen that before. And I also believed that my skis, because my skis were way down here as I was skiing, and it was well under the weak layer, or what was going to be the, the weak layer, the, you know, the uh, breaking point there. I had also believed that because my skis were so deep that it, it wouldn't fracture that. I mean, once again, I'm just making stuff up in my head, but I believed that. I believed that because my skis were underneath the weak layer that it would not, it couldn't trigger. And I, and I didn't even really call that a weak layer. I was just calling, I mean, it was just something I noted. SB0 quality too is like, whatever, you just put, that's just placing the stuff sack on the shovel and it, and it fractures, you know, it's not even dropping it from a height because it's just all powder. So, um, this really changed my thoughts on what a slab is because I'd always thought it needed to be a lot denser than it does. And this was in 2002, it's uh, February 5th, uh, 2001 actually is when this happened. Um, and I'm gonna, I've got a video clip because it wasn't until this year that I saw it happen again. And it was in an extended column test on bacon rind. I was with Carl. And it, so it took 12 years later. So 12 years later, I see it for the second time where I get a fracture just on the new snow um, on this. And I have a little video clip of it. Let's see here. Bear with me one sec. Snow, which is pretty cool actually, because this <laughs> is a fist hardened slab. This is something we don't see often, where we actually can have a slab propagate a fracture that's so kind of light density. This is all new snow from the last two days. So it's probably not going to live very long, but we're going to be definitely watching this today. So I was pretty excited. And In conclusion, only expose one person at a time when digging your pit. It becomes, it's a little less of an issue now because of some of the research Carl's done using the extended column test where, where he's found that um, your stability test results are not a function of the steepness of the slope. So if you're, you're still getting uh, really good scores, um, with an, certainly an extended column test on shallower angled slopes, you don't have to go out to a 37 degree slope. Even though we still do, there's still plenty of times when it's a, it, we, need to, we feel the need to get out there, we want to get out there, and we are on something a little steeper. But just be hyper, hyper aware about both of you being out there in case something goes wrong. And then, of course, even low-density snow can act as a slab. And uh, 
So that's all I got. Those are, I keep going back to those time and time again uh, in my career. So questions or plays? When you describe a slab as a little meteor stiffer, I'm curious about what you meant. I mean, I want a little more specifics. And specifically, I'm curious as to whether the top of it had a slight wind skin or anything. No, there was no slight wind skin. It was more that it went from like fist to fist plus, where it. it the whole slab, not just the yeah, it was more the it was more just that upper that upper layer of you know a foot or so you know it just and now you know I'd use the language that you know it it it, it has it could propagate a fracture the slab could you know could propagate it could it could keep the the fracture going where maybe on the other slope where it was so light density or lower density that uh, it wasn't able to I'm I'm not sure but I know Carl was pretty interested when I came back from from that day. <laughs> I guess I'm curious as to what you, why, if you, if you have a possible hypothesis to why it was a little denser. Yeah, it was because if you, if it was a slight broad ridge, and so there was a wind loading uh, from that. A little bit. Huh? Yep. So I can. Uh, so right here, um, the winds are blowing across. The winds are coming from this direction, and so they can slightly load this area in here. Although I, I would not call it wind loaded at the time, it was just touched by the wind. Is all I could would really <laughs> describe because there was no note. You didn't like go over there and go whoa, 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 totally different. You know, it was just something where you're like, huh, just slightly more, you know, neat to it. Did you go to the crowd on that? No, we did not. I was. We were looking for Alan's ski and, you know, all that. <laughs> he was crying. I had to, you know, <laughs> lead him. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. <laughs> Where did he end up at the bottom of the path? Did it go? No, he did not end up at the bottom. He ended up right here um, off. He got pushed off to the side and was missed these little trees over on the side, um, thankfully. Um, he did a little bit of a somersault. And uh, I mean, as you, you know, most people know, I mean, it's, it's just pure luck, you know, as to where he was, how he ended up. He could have ended up upside down, but he didn't. He was, you know, standing up to his waist after getting flipped through a few pecker trees. Was that the whole slab attached or is that the extent of slab and... That slab and run, that's the whole, yeah. I, I'm not sure how much of the slab actually sure. pulled out. I just... <laughs> I was standing here, saw this go, and then saw the powder cloud just bearing down and hit him. And the debris, like I said um, in my notes, the debris was only three to four feet deep, so it wasn't terribly deep. So, you know, I, I would guess that it was probably just pulling out the stuff, you know, in this upper third. Yeah, that was like way over here. It was in a really... Uh, different area where no one would ever be skiing um, but it ran when that went that ended up running all the way down to the trail that's how come we got the the observation on that any more questions yeah i just got a comment it, it's i think like all your dates are early 2000s mm -hmm. and just kind of how far we've come with uh more people skiing, but like anecdotal stories, uh, research with digging pits in the flats, assumptions that I think a lot of us used to have, we no longer hold anymore, and I think there's no real point, but there has been an evolution in understanding of, uh, you know, we probably in another 15 years are going to look back and, and say, hey, we're so much further along yeah. too. It's just an observation of the It's true. The assumptions that we no longer make, that mm -hmm. we used to you know, make all the time. Hopefully we'll keep learning. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Um, thank you, and I think Rod's up next. <laughs>